Hi, this lesson is about the limit of a function. So this notation is read as the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. That means that the closer x gets to some number a, your f of x or your y is getting close to l. The, there are um, scenarios uh, where the limit would exist, and two scenarios where the limit exists is if the limit value as x approaches a is equal to the function value at a. And so this would be an example of what that would look like. The closer I get to a on either side of a, if I follow the path of the function, which are the y values, it looks like that path is leading me to this point, which is the value of f of a, which I'm calling l, l for the limit value. And in this case, a, your value of a would be in the domain of the function. The function is defined at a, and it is also equal to the value um, that this limit is approaching. Another scenario where the limit exists is something like this. As you get closer and closer to a and follow the path of the function, it looks like this path is leading me towards this open circle, uh, which has coordinates a, f of a. So, um, um, so in this case, oh, sorry, this was actually an equal sign there. So in this case, the limit value is approaching this open circle at f of a, which is L, but a is not in the domain. So open means it's not defined on your function, but the limit does exist because your y values are getting closer and closer to that open circle. So there's two scenarios where the limit exists, but in the first case, your value of a is in the domain, and in the second example, the value of a is not in the domain. Okay, we have something called one-sided limits. So if you consider the limit of a function from one side, either the left side or the right side, that's what you consider a one-sided limit. So before I said, as I get closer to a on the left and on the right, so this is the notation for the left-hand limit. So it's the limit of f of x uh, as x approaches a from the left. So that means your x's would be less than a when it's to the left. And the limit as x approaches a from the right has this notation. Um, and that's the limit of f of x as x approaches a from the right. A could be any number. It could be positive, negative, or zero. The minus sign immediately to the right means from the left, and the plus sign immediately to the right of the number means from the right side of A. So a limit exists if and only if the following is true. So the limit as x approaches A of f of x equals L if and only if the left-hand limit equals L and the right-hand limit equals L as well. So from both the left side and the right side of A, your function values or your Y values have to be cl getting closer and closer to some value that we're calling L. Um, but there are many examples where the limit does not exist. And so in this first example, I have um, a piecewise function, which you can see here on the graph. And so if I read this piecewise function and I evaluate the limit from the left, so this is the left-hand limit, that means the closer I get to 2 on the left side, if I follow the path of the graph on that side, it seems to be getting closer and closer to this point right here, which has a, a value of 3. So that would be my left-hand limit. And if I get closer and closer to 2 on the right side of 2, and follow the path of the graph as I get closer to 2, it seems to be getting closer and closer to that open circle, which has a y value of 0. So my right-hand limit is equal to 0. The function exists at 2 because I have a solid point here. So f of 2 equals 3. But the limit does not exist because this is not true. The limit from the left and the right have two different answers. Uh, the left side is 3, the right side is 0, and so therefore the limit at 2 does not exist. 
Here's another example. This is also a piecewise function. And so here I want to evaluate the limit as x approaches 1. So when you approach 1 from the left and follow the path of the graph, I'm on this part, and that seems to be getting closer and closer to this value here, which has a y value of 2. But when I'm on the right side of 1 and I follow the path, the closer I get to 1, the closer my y value is getting to um, negative 2. Um, so my left and right hand limit are different, therefore the limit does not exist. But this function also does not exist at 1 because at 1 my y values are both open circles. There is no solid point associated um, with the value of x equal to 1. So in the second example, the limit does not exist and the function does not exist uh, at 1. But in the first example, the limit does not exist, but the function did exist at 2. So those are just some of the scenarios that can come up. And another reason why the limit does not exist is if your limit approaches either positive or negative infinity. So an example of that is here in example 3. So if I evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 from the left, so if you follow this graph, as I get closer and closer to 0 on the left and I follow the path, it looks like it's going towards negative infinity. And when I'm on the right side of 0 and I follow the path of the graph, on that side it seems to be going towards positive infinity. So if your limit goes to either positive or negative infinity, it doesn't matter that these are different. It matters that they are not only different, but they are not finite numbers. Then your limit does not exist. And this is another example of where f of 0 is undefined. It looks like at x equal to 0, I actually have a vertical asymptote. So uh, 0 is not in the domain of this function. And this is probably the graph of a rational function. Looks a lot like our reciprocal function, which is 1 over x. The graph of it would look a lot like what I just drew. Um, so here we want to um, evaluate a limit not by looking at graphs the way we just did but by using something called a numerical analysis which means we are going to plug in numbers uh, that are close to 1 on the left side and the right side of 1 and see what happens when I compute the value of y which is uh, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. So remember I can't just plug in 1 in here because if I did I would get 0 over 0, which is undefined. So I really do need to plug in numbers that are close to 1, um, but not equal to 1. So these are the numbers that are to the left of 1 that are close to 1. So 0.9 is close, 0.99 is even closer. So those are just two examples, but I could have picked 0 0.999, 0 0.99999, um, so the more nines there are to the right of the decimal point, the closer you are to 1. Um, and then when I compute my function value is I'm going to plug them into uh, x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. And my y value for 0 0.9 is 1.9. My y value for 0.99 is 1.99. So that's what's happening on the left side. On the right side... 1.1 is close to 1, but on the right of it. 1.01 is even closer. And when I plug in those two numbers, at 1.1, the y value is 2.1. And at 1.01, the y value is 2.01. Remember, you're plugging in your x's right in here to find the y row. Okay, so I based on th this limited information, I'm going to make an assumption. Because it looks like the closer my x's get to 1 on either the left side or the right side, it looks like my y's are getting very close to the number 2. So I'm going to say that the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 um, is equal to 2. And the graph of this 
function actually confirms that. Um, the graph of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 actually looks like a line with a hole at 1, 2. And the reason why I know it's at 1, 2, well, at 1 it's undefined because, again, I'd have a 0 here. And when I factor this, um, I have a common factor in the numerator and the denominator. And when that occurs, you will have a hole at the solution to that common factor. So if you were to set this equal to 0, that means I have a hole at 1. And the way you know what the y value is, well, that's your limit value. But you could also plug it in right here in the part that's um, left over after you cancel. So if I plug in 1, 1 plus 1, I get 2 as a result. So I have an open circle or a hole at 1, 2. Okay, so that means the function does not exist at 1, but the limit does. And you can see from the graph that as I get closer and closer to 1 on the left side and on the right side of 1, and if I follow the path of the graph, on the left side I'm going towards this point, on the right side, I'm going towards that point, and so uh, it converges to the value of 2, which is the y value of that hole. Okay, so again, there's a numerical way to evaluate limits, and there is also um, a graphical way to evaluate limits. So I did it both ways for this example. The numerical way showed that um, 2 is my limit, and I also see that on this graph, um, that the y value here is 2. All right, so here I want to evaluate the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of the natural log of x. The reason why I'm only interested in approaching 0 from the right is because the domain for the natural log is only positive numbers. Um, so it would not make sense to evaluate the limit from the left side of 0 because numbers to the left of 0 are negative, and natural log is not defined there. And this is one where you really do need to be familiar with what the graph looks like. The natural log function looks like this. It's got an x-intercept at 1, 0, because ln of 1 equals 0. And as you get closer and closer to 0 on the right, you can see that this function is going towards uh, negative infinity. The y values are getting smaller and smaller as you get closer to zero on the right side. And so again, when you get an answer like this, a positive or negative infinity, that means that this limit does not exist. That's what D and E stands for, does not exist. Okay, so here we're gonna sketch the graph of f of x that satisfies the following conditions. So um, what that means is that you're given these conditions and we want to graph a a sketch of a function that would match with what those limits are saying. There is more than one correct answer here. So the picture that you see on the right is just one option. So the first condition is that the limit as x approaches 0 from the left uh, is approaching 1. So that means that I need something on the left side of 0 that is getting closer and closer to a y value of 1. So that's this whole part right here. That's the first condition. The second condition says that the limit as um, x approaches 0 from the right is approaching negative 2. And so that's what this is showing. And this part here, f of 0 equals 1, that's letting us know that this one needs to be solid, not this one here. You can't have two solid points vertically aligned because then it would not be a function. That would mean that you would have one x value for two y's and that doesn't satisfy the definition of a function. So you need to look at all three conditions uh, to sketch your graph. Okay, um, in this next example we are going to sketch the graph of f of x that satisfies the following conditions. And so these are the conditions. I have the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x equals 0. The limit as x approaches 0 from the left equals infinity. The limit as x approaches 0 from the right equals negative infinity. 
and the limit as x approaches infinity uh, is equal to 0. So the first two conditions are this part right here. So the limit as x approaches negative infinity goes to 0. That's this part. And as x approaches 0 from the left goes to infinity, that's that part right there. So the first two conditions are basically in quadrant um, 2. Then the second two conditions is this piece here in quadrant 4. So the limit as x approaches 0 from the right goes to negative infinity. That's this piece. And the limit as x approaches infinity equals 0. That's that, that piece right there. So, um, so that was yet another example of how to sketch a graph given conditions for limits. So you do need to understand what the definition means for a limit, how to understand functional notation um, in order to sketch these. So um, this next part is about how to evaluate a limit with a much simpler um, method, but it only works in certain conditions. So if the value of a is in the domain of f of x, then the limit as x approaches a, so this is what we, we mean by a, that same number, um, can be evaluated by direct substitution. And by direct substitution just means plug in the value of a into your function. So this is the simplest way to evaluate a limit, but it only works when a is in the domain. So in this example, I have, I want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative one of x squared minus two x plus three. Okay, negative one is definitely in the domain of this because it is a quadratic. It's a type of polynomial function. The domain of these functions is all real numbers, negative 1 is a real number. So I can go ahead and plug them in. Um, so you have negative 1 squared minus 2 times negative 1 plus 3. That gives me 1 plus 2 plus 3. So my limit value is equal to 6. In part B here on the right, I have a radical. Um, and remember, Radicals do have restrictions on the domain, but as long as what's on the inside doesn't result in a negative number, then, um, then you're okay. And so when I plug in 2, I do not get a negative number. You actually get the square root of 2 times 2 plus 5, which is the square root of 9, which gives me a limit value of 3. So if the answer inside of here was negative, that means the value that you're trying to substitute is not actually in the domain, so you would not be able to evaluate that limit. Part C, this is a rational function. And remember, rational functions, again, oftentimes have restrictions, um, but as long as what you plug in doesn't give you a zero in the denominator, then you can go ahead and do this by direct substitution. Um, so if I plug in negative 2, you'll get 3 times negative 2 over negative 2 squared minus 4 times negative 2. That's negative 6 over 4 plus 8. That's negative 6 over 12, which gives me a value of negative a half. And then part D is asking us to evaluate the limit as t approaches 0 of 4 to the t over t to the third plus 1. Again, you just, whatever you plug in, as long as it doesn't give you a zero in the denominator, then you can go ahead and use uh, this method of direct substitution. So if you plug in zero, you get four to the zero over zero to the third plus one. Four to the zero is one and the denominator is also one. So my limit value is just one. So notice in all four of these examples, that once you substitute in the value for the independent variable, you no longer write your limit. So already in step two, when I plugged in or did direct substitution, I did not write my limit in front of the function any longer. And so that is proper notation. Um, so once direct substitution is applied, you no longer write the limit in front of the function.
Okay, but what happens when the value of a is not in the domain? When it's not in the domain, that means there is additional work that you need to do um, because sometimes it is possible to simplify the function first and then apply direct substitution. And simplifying oftentimes will mean that you are factoring, but other times it might mean expanding and combining like terms. Um, so we're gonna do a few different examples. So part A has the limit as X approaches two of X squared minus four over X minus two. So I can't just go ahead and plug in two in here because then I'll have a zero in the denominator and we know that is undefined. But this is an example, so, sorry, so this is an example where two is not in the domain, but I can simplify the rational expression by factoring. So the numerator factors into x plus two x minus two, which will then cancel with the denominator. So I'm just left with x plus two and now I can plug in uh, the 2 in here into x plus 2. And so I get 2 plus 2 gives me a limit value of 4. So again, I just want to point out the notation here. When I was simplifying, the limit is still written all throughout. You stop writing the limit when you apply direct substitution, when this 2 gets plugged in here in for x but all of the algebra before it should still have the limit in front of it. All right, so part B, here's another one. If you plugged in negative one, um, this denominator would be zero, so we can't do this by direct substitution immediately, but it is sim uh, something you could simplify. The numerator is the difference of perfect squares. It factors into t plus one, t minus one. The denominator factors into 2t plus 1 and t plus 1. The t plus 1 factor cancels. Um, so I'm just left with t minus 1 over 2t plus 1. Again, all of these still have the limit in front of it. And then from this line to that line, that's when I'm substituting negative 1 into what's left. So you no longer write your limit. So I have negative 1 minus 1 over 2 times negative 1 plus 1. That gives me negative two over negative one for a limit value of two. Okay, so in the next one, part C, I did it two different ways. Um, so on the left side in orange, what I did was I expanded this, so I foiled it. So I get nine plus six H plus H squared, and then I just brought down that nine. Um, all over h. The nines cancel, so I'm left with 6h plus h squared all over h. Um, and then the numerator has a common factor of h, so I factored that out, and I'm left with h times 6 plus h. But then the h that I factored out cancels with the denominator, and I'm just left with 6 plus h. At this point, you can plug in the zero right in here, so six plus zero gives me a limit value of six. So again, write your limit in front of your uh, function all throughout while you're simplifying, and then you stop writing your limit when you plug in uh, the value of h equal to zero. I couldn't plug it in right here um, or any of these other steps um, that followed because then I would have a zero in the denominator, which we know is undefined. Okay, another method, and this is an or, you don't have to do it both ways. Um, I treated this as the difference of perfect squares, where your a is three plus h and your b is three because three squared is nine. And so the way you factor the difference of perfect squares, it's gonna be three plus h plus three, this is a plus b, and then three plus h minus three, this is a minus b. That's how you factor the difference of perfect squares. And when I do that, it will look similar to some of the work that's on the left side because these threes cancel. And then I'm just left with, this one is six plus h, this one here is just h. 
that H in the numerator cancels with the H in the denominator. And then again, you're just left with this. So you can plug in zero for H and you get again the same answer, which is that the limit is equal to six. So the second method is actually a little bit faster, um, but the first method works just as well. Okay, so here we want to sketch a piecewise function. g of x is equal to x squared for values of x less than or equal to 0, and g of x is equal to the square root of x plus 1 for values of x greater than 0. And then we'll evaluate these three limits as well as the function at 0. So the first part of my piecewise function is a parabola, and um, I only, I'm going to show half of the parabola because it's only... Uh, um, defined for values of x less than or equal to 0. So that's this part here in quadrant 2. And the other um, function is your square root function. You want to start at 0. Um, so when I plug in 0, this is going to be the square root of 0 plus 1, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. So 0, 1 is an open circle right here. And then you want to plug in numbers greater than zero, like let's say three. Three is a good choice because it works out to be a nice uh, perfect square. So that'll give me the square root of four, which is two. So three, two is on this graph. So you connect the open circle to that point and there's the graph of the second part of the piecewise function. So uh, you're asked to evaluate the limit as X approaches zero from the left. So from the left side, I'm on the parabola. And the closer I get to zero on the left, my y value equals zero. Um, but then the next part is what's the limit of g of x as x approaches zero from the right? When I'm on the right side, you are on the square root function. And the closer I get to zero, the closer my y value is getting to that open circle, which has a value of one. Remember, it doesn't have to be defined on the function at 0, 1. It just has to be getting close to 0, 1. Um, and then the question is, what's the limit as x approaches 0 of g of x? Well, you would say it does not exist because the left-hand limit and the right-hand limit are not equal. So that was the definition that I gave at the beginning of the lesson for a limit to exist. The left and right-hand limit must be the same. Okay, and then the last part is to evaluate g of 0. g of 0 is what is the value of g when x is 0? So this is when your x is 0 because it's less than or equal to. When you plug that in, <coughs> you get 0 squared, which is 0, which is actually this point right here. When x is 0, y is 0. And g of 0 is just another way of saying y. Okay, so here we're going to sketch the graph of f of x and evaluate the following. The limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x, the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x, and um, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x, and the limit as x approaches infinity. So we have a whole bunch of limits to evaluate. This is my piecewise function, x to the third, for values of x less than 1, and 2x minus 1 for values of x greater than 1. So x to the third, if you remember, um, the parent function of x to the third, if it goes through 0, 0, this is y equal to x to the third. <coughs> so I only need to show it from 1, 1, so it's only this piece here. So that's that part. But at 1, it's undefined because it's less than. So I know that at 1, 1, I'm going to put an open circle. And then the second part is a line. And you definitely need to plug in what uh, 1 right here in this line. So when I plug in 1, um, you also get 1. So it's still the same open circle as I got with the first piece. Uh, 2x minus 1 has an open circle at 1, 1. And then just plug in one other number. I plugged in 2, and when you plug in 2, you get 3. 
So you connect this open circle to that closed one and you sketch it going upward and to the right because it's only for values of x greater than 1. So once you have a good sketch, then you can um, evaluate these limits. And so the first one says, what is the limit as x approaches negative infinity of x to the third? So the further you go to the left, right, your x is going to negative infinity, it looks like this is going towards negative infinity. So there's one limit. Uh, the next one is as x approaches 1 from the left. So I get closer and closer to 1 on the left, and I follow the path of this graph. It's getting closer and closer to that y value, which is 1. But when I'm on the right side, which is when you're on the line, and I get closer and closer to 1, I'm also getting closer to that open circle, which has a y value of 1. So my left-hand limit and my right-hand limit are both equal. So therefore, the limit as x approaches 1 of f of x also equals 1. That's the definition. If you have the same limit, the same value of the limit on the left and right side, then the limit exists, and it will be the same answer. And then the last part is what is the limit as x approaches infinity? So it looks like the further you go to the right, this graph is getting bigger and bigger. So... Um, it's going towards infinity. And then notice this is another one where my limit exists because my left-hand limit and my right-hand limit are both equal, but f of 1 is undefined. It does not exist. At no value of x uh, is it ever equal to 1. It's either less than 1 or greater than 1. So that's why we have an open circle um, at that at 1, 1. Okay, so here's one for you to try. So you want to use the graph to answer the following questions. And the first one says to state the domain and range using interval notation. Remember, for domain, you're reading the x values or the x-axis. And for the range, you're reading the y-axis. You always state intervals from smallest to largest. Then part B is asking you to evaluate f of negative 3. And it is possible that your answer is that it does not exist or it's undefined. For part C, you want to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 3. That means you have to check the path of the function from the left side and the right side of negative 3. Part D says to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the left. Part E says to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right. Um, part F is asking you to evaluate the function at negative 2. And then G, your question is, does the limit as x approaches negative 2 of f of x is, exist? That will depend on what your answers are here. If the two answers are the same, then you would say yes, and it would have the same value. But if the two answers in D and E are different, then your answer in G is that it does not exist. So that's it for this lesson. Good luck.